Form follows flow. So, what is beauty? And how does it best flow in time? And why does it matter? My journey started 20 years ago as an architecture student in London. I have always been interested in, in art and in science, and architecture was the, perhaps the best way to synthesize those two interests. And it was a great training in holistic thinking. Um, the bridge between art and science is, is geometry. And we don't need to think of it as mass or equations, we just need to think of it as, as shapes, as pictures. Shapes in space, but as I'll be expounding on a little bit more today, in time as well. Geometry is about, also, it's about relationships. It's about the relationship of relationships. So what I'm hoping to, to be able to share with you guys today is how nature seems to be able to design by playing with, with chaos to create, to unfold creation on a continuous basis. Creation didn't just happen 13.3 or whatever it is billion years ago. It's happening right now. It's unfolding in front of us, as long as I don't trip over the rug. We're here to smooth out the bumps in the rug, if you like. So, here's an example. Glaciers and global flight paths. They both flow. One is a, a flow of ice or water over a landscape. The other is a flow of people, rivers of ice or rivers of people across a landscape, across the, the, the ground, in the case of rivers and glaciers, or across the sky, in, in the case of us flying around the world to conferences like TED. So, as an example, if I was to fly from, say, Shanghai to Hong Kong, I might take a 777, which is a short journey. Um, but from Hong Kong to London, I might go on a super jumbo, on an A380, which is about double the size. It's a much larger body, a wider volume. And that's just like the way a river or a glacier would flow. Your 777 would be the smaller tributaries. Your super jumbo would be down here, the widest part. It's a law of nature, if you like. It's, it's a pattern. Um, let's not get highfalutin about it. it it's, it's shapes, it's patterns that we see and enjoy and find attractive. So... TEDx this year is about ripples. So what are ripples? How can we think of ripples? We could imagine them as being nested concentric circles, but they, they're also waves that can interfere with each other and develop structure. They're, they're fractals, fractal flow systems. Fractals are self-similar geometric shapes that either scale up or down in scale but they're the result of flows, as I'll develop on in a moment. Now, where do these flows come from? These flows emerge, if you like, from heat doing work, from energy. We started um, the, at the Big Bang with uh, a lot of energy and what's known as a very low entropy beginning. What's entropy? We can think of it as disorder. We can think of it as the tendency for a leaf to decay um, and for there being an infinite amount of shapes that could result that would be disordered and random in this box and only one order that would look exactly like this. So entropy is the way over time we have a far higher probability of this, these random permutations of the shapes. So, how do we get order? How do we get life? How do we get societies? How do we get TEDx? Us, as a society, thinking aloud. How does that happen? Apparently, from what we can tell over the, um, the research done over the last 50 years in the sciences of complexity, is that global order in the whole environment, whether it's the planet or the solar system or galaxy or universe, that goes up, it always goes up. This disorder probability always wins. But in a local cell, in a small area, entropy can go down if it's being powered by an external energy source. In our case, for the planet, it's for planet Earth, it's the sun. 
So there needs to be an external energy source, and there needs to be an open system where the energy flows through and where the entropy is exported out so that global entropy continues to go up. So no laws are defied. In fact, the geometries of those flows, the signatures, are, are very distinctive, and they happen to be fractal. They happen to be self-similar. So as I was saying, the geometrical forms that express copies of themselves, that's up and down in scale, they can be living or non-living. And in a way, you, we could say that they let heat do work most effectively to design forms that, that follow ever fitter flows. And we find them, as you saw there, in the cross-section of a human lung, a kidney, or a river system. So living, non-living, they're a common geometry and these geometries have been described uh, by a new law of physics known as the Constructal Law. Essentially, it, it describes how fractals in nature are created. Fractals uh, occur because of the flow of heat and energy in nature. So, the, the, the Constructal Law, if you like, explains the source or the cause of fractal geometry. The flip side of that, of the flows of energy that the constructor law describes, is the Asensis Principle. And that's a line of research that I've followed the last 20 years, starting in London at the Computer Science Faculty of Westminster University. To cut a long story short, it's the geometries that we were talking about, the geometries of optimal energy flow. And it could be summarized as saying that good forms, ideal forms, beautiful forms, follow true flows, where the flows are most efficient and most optimal, which leads to more for less in terms of optimization, more bang for your buck, if you like, and for longer. We can think of it as the, the, the constructor law we could think of as being like, like a dance, and the dancers and the ascensus principle as being like the score, the musical score and the choreography. You can't have one without the other. So, getting back to the question I posed earlier, what is beauty? We have beauty in space, but also beauty in time. Che bella! That's Botticelli's Venus. I don't know how many of you met her. She was uh, visiting Hong Kong recently, the last couple of months. And she, she went to, to Macau as well, courtesy of uh, Pansy Ho. She, um, she was the most beautiful girl in, in Florence at the time, much admired in the Renaissance by uh, Botticelli and his fellow artists. She represents spatial beauty, physical beauty, a nobility of spirit and a beauty of body, translucent skin, flowing locks, expressing many complex emotions and feelings in a single painting and in a single person a long, presumably, lineage of other attractive people as well. So, she's, she's a, my exemplar for beauty in space, for spatial 3D beauty. Beauty in time, which led, perhaps, to forms like, like her, we could describe as being freer, truer flow, any flow of information, her DNA, perhaps, um, energy, mass, it's essentially, information that seems to be processed, either as patterns of energy or matter. We could think of that as resources. And that, those flows in time, as you can see here, can be at any scale. And when those flows are most efficient and optimal, they're beautiful. Now the bridge, the geometric bridge that seems to connect the form and the flow, appears one of them, one of the optimal geometries appears to be the famous golden ratio, which goes back to the ancient Greeks, the Egyptians even perhaps, uh, through the Renaissance to uh, the 20th century, uh, and uh, here with us now. The best way to think of it is it's an archetypal fractal. It's a primordial seed fractal. It's the way nature minimizes the work she does for the most reward, the most resources. It's literally one scaling itself down or up in a continuous series 
and it allows for the principle of least energy to be, to be operated through her, uh, th through this, this geometry. If you like, it's simplexity exemplified. It's compressing, like data compression, compressing, compressing complexity into the simplest possible package over space and time. We're finding it, for example, in the periods of planetary orbits around this sun, at least, around our solar system, where Fibonacci series golden ratio periods of the planets actually seem to follow this, this geometry in time. And we're also finding it in one of the cutting-edge theories of consciousness as the most complex area of human consciousness. So it was a bit old hat and a little bit, um, a little bit more on the spatial side, but it's definitely coming back big time uh, in terms of dynamical systems and how nature seems to flow. So Leonardo and Pythagoras, Euclid, all those guys seem to have been right in terms of the spatial behaviors. But what we seem to be seeing is that this is, a, this is also happening in time. That, that, that's what's distinctive about uh, the, the conclusions that we've been coming to over the last couple of years. One example, though, in nature of the golden ratio flowing in time, aiding growth and manifesting beauty is in plant growth, in the way uh, plants and ecosystems seem to minimize the energy they spend for the most reward. Uh, we see it in the way ferns unfold, or the way cactus uh, leaves or, or flower petals grow. And the reason for this is that they allow plants to have the maximum sunlight, the most exposure to uh, nutrients both in the ground and in the atmosphere, uh, and also to have the best strength to weight ratio. So it's just a, a killer app for how to grow and, and, and to survive in, in a, a fitness landscape, in an environment. And life is the best example. And we carry these fractals inside ourselves as well. We don't look very fractal looking at us. But uh, 700 million years ago, the only creatures in the, uh, on the world were fern-shaped animals living in the oceans. We just carry those fractals inside us now, as our veins, our lungs, our nervous systems, our hearts, e everything, our brains, and, and the, the oceans as well, inside our bodies. That's why we're 70% salt water. So these optimal geometries allow nature to play. They, they take systems to the edge of chaos, as it's known, to, to a, a region known as self-organized criticality, where uh, geometries like the Penrose tiling, based on the golden ratio, show how nature seems to play with chaos to create. And that's my boy Neo demonstrating nature in action with his building blocks there. So two examples of the golden ratio embedded in, in icons of uh, chaos theory and fractals. Uh, the Mandelbrot set, that's a finite boundary with an sorry, a finite area with an infinite boundary. The paradoxical object, it's, it's a higher dimensional object used to model um, the complex plane, which is basically where we, we find uh, quantum and relativistic maths, but the, I, I won't go there. Um, those, those, uh, Man the Mandelbrot set has little copies of it as you scale in and out. I'm sure you've all seen the, the videos on YouTube. And they are very similar to, to viral memes, to viral ideas, just like, for example, um, the Ice Bucket Challenge or Gang Gang Style, which I won't demonstrate, <laughs> but <laughs> unless you throw money. Uh, but ba basically, it's a geometry in, in time of the way our society behaves. These are mathematical models. The golden ratio is embedded inside them. And this is how. It's called period two. And I didn't have the time, but I would have brought uh, a skipping rope to, uh, and Micah uh, to, uh, to demonstrate period two. Basically, it's the lowest energy dynamical wave over time. And that's where the golden ratio is. So in, if you like, it's a geometric proof. And it can be expressed as an equation, an equation that just as form follows flow, flow leads form. This is the flow part. 
This is an equation, Euler's relation. It's been described as one of the most beautiful equations in maths. It's the only equation I'm going to show you. Uh, and it expresses waves. It's fundamentally based on the physics of uh, tossing coins. In Australia, we'd call that two up. And, and this side is the uh, equation for the golden ratio. The two seem to work together in tandem. The two sides of the same coin, form and flow. So what's the takeaway from all of this? I think one of them has got to be that optimal is beautiful. It's as simple as that. And we could think of it as, as a, a, a new way, a new path, a Tao of design, a fusion, transcultural, east meets west way of looking at design. So the implication then is that to be ungreen has got to be unbeautiful because nature's green. Nature's always green, always sus sustainable. It always tries to design itself to persist for the longest time in harmony with its environment. So if being ungreen is unbeautiful, green has got to be beautiful. This, these geometries here are optimal foams. They're just made from dishwashing liquid, but they again express a synthesis geometries. They've recently been, uh, been described. Soap films with the minimum energy structure and minimum materials for maximum effect. They're hexagonal with pentagons inside. And they're the result, again, of optimal flow and optimal use of resources. Now, what's an example of how we might use that in architecture to brand Hong Kong and to promote the Asensis principle um, if we want our society, our, our civilization to be more optimal? How about um, killing two birds and um, uh, proposing an icon for West Kowloon Cultural District and for Hong Kong's harbor? Reinventing the wheel with a horizontal as opposed to a vertical uh, Ferris wheel with uh, bars and restaurants inside or mahjong parlors or foot massage, whatever works. It's a, you could say it would be a combination of the Eiffel Tower and the London Eye and be a development catalyst, a wow factor for, for the cultural district to get people excited about it in the same way that um, the London Eye does for uh, the South Bank Cultural Centre or um, the Eiffel Tower, dare I say, does for the Trocadero. So if you can sketch the Eiffel Tower or the London Eye in 10 seconds, maybe it's an icon. As designed with the, the original team from when we first proposed it a few years ago and another location, we would like to demonstrate uh, aspects of the Ascensus principle, such as optimal structure with more strength for less weight, dynamic tensegrity, tension and compression with all the forces being expressed of the cables and the struts, showing how the forces flow down to the ground. You have a series of pods that wind, that spiral up and down to give you the observation tower and platform aspects of the Eiffel Tower, but also a wheel that continuously spins, giving us 360 panoramic views of Hong Kong's amazing harbour. Think of it as a a 360-degree crane to an infinite horizon. It, it, it could also be a test bed for green materials and components like thin film photovoltaics. So it would be a continuously evolving structure to not just represent sustainability in nature, but also I I in practice, in, in our culture. Planetary human impacts. We, um, we're a geological force now. We have more impact on the planet than, than any other force. And that, um, that uh, force is uh, definitely causing us some problems and will we'll start to even more over time because of global warming. So perhaps one way of, um, of adapting to this is to map some of what we're learning from nature's economy and elegance and beauty in the way nature flows into new forms and to map some of those insights onto our civilization and onto society. And we have some ideas about that. You can, uh, um, we can talk about those later if you like. So these are, these are originally Greek geometries. What's the connection with Chinese philosophy? I was explaining to my wife um, 
a few months ago that I was looking into the geometries of energy flow before participating in a science conference at Nanjing University um, in October last year uh, with the constructal law uh, people. And um, she said, energy flow, oh, that's, that's qi. That's qi. We've known about that for thousands of years. Like so many other things, the Chinese got there first. They invented it first. And I'm not just talking about noodles. <laughs> so, optimization, optimal flow, unblocking your flow, that's the concept of qi. The patterns of, of that optimal flow, we could say that's li. It's a Chinese concept of, of patterns in nature and explicitly part of the Taoist philosophy. So, when your, your qi is unblocked, you're, unluck you're lucky, should I say. If it is blocked, you're unlucky. It's inauspicious. So perhaps this is a way to connect the ideas of sustainability with, with the Asian market, with Asian stakeholders, so that everybody understands that if we're not being green, as much as we can, within budget constraints and schedules, if we're not, we're going to be very unlucky. It's going to be bad for business. So in closing, the Tao of design, form follows flow. To answer the question that I posed at the beginning, beauty abides wherever good form follows true flow. It's when ideas and resources are best synergized and where potential is the most realized, the most released. And that, that applies across the board. It's a general principle. We could also say that it's it's a simplexity. It's where the complex is rendered most simple, most beautifully, for longer, most easily. Thank you very much. <laughs>